All right, so we have got macroeconomics on the 21st of September. So we left off last time, and what we'll be talking about, right? We were talking about those different uh, determinants of average labor productivity, right? So what were those determinants, right? Well, we found that there were six of them. So the first of them was human capital, right? The skills and training of the workers. So we can just say human K. Remember, every time we use K, that's just our abbreviation for capital. What about uh, the second thing, right? Well, it's not just human capital, there's other types of capital, right? We need computers, surfaces, projectors, rooms, desks, right? We need all that stuff. We need physical capital. Where are we doing this? At, at some point, we're not all plugged into the matrix just quite yet, right? So we need some sort of physical space Right? And then also we kind of just lump in natural resources there, right? So, you know, this could be, you know, just fresh air. We talked about that on Friday. Or water. You know, in order for all these breweries and stuff like that, right? They need fresh water. They need clean water uh, in, order, in order to produce. Uh, the sophistication of the different types of technology, right? So the technological level. Essentially, how do I put all of those together? Uh, kind of in that same vein of how do I put all those together? The management uh, and the entrepreneurship, right? So entrepreneurship. Uh, or the management style of that particular place, right? And then lastly, perhaps the one that, you know, is, is most difficult for us to wrap our heads around, right, is going to be this notion of uh, a, a, it's what's called institutions. The book doesn't really use the term, but essentially this is talking about uh, the broad social and legal environment, right? Social and legal environment. It's not just the, the norms and kind of how much is property protected, uh, but it's, it's, it's also, you know, how long does it take things to go through the courts? Um, how, how often do you have labor disputes? How, you know, violent are the labor disputes? Uh, what, what can you do as management in terms of what, what can you do in the letter of the law to resolve those disputes, so on and so forth, right? So all of these things are going to, are going to be the, the largest determinants that we, that we found in terms of average labor productivity, right? And uh, remember, we left off and we said we were going to talk about medieval China, right? And specifically talking about, you know, the, the, the institutions, right? So kind of a situation where it was the institutional failings that we can really, at the end of the day, say were part, you know, a, a lot of the reason why uh, economic stag stagnation happened, right? So, you know, in medieval China, uh, you know, this was during the period of 960 to 1270 AD, right? And so this is the uh, Song period in Chinese history, right? And, and you know, they were incredibly uh, sophisticated technologically, right? Very technologically sophisticated. How so? Well, they had, you know, they had paper, they had gunpowder, right? They had fireworks, they had water wheels, they were able to harness, 
power of the rivers that go by, right? And you know, there's there's some different accounts in terms of they may even have a, a working version of a compass. So they had this great, amazing technological system that's happened, right? But what what happened afterwards, right? So so essentially economic stagnation. followed this period of great technological advance, right? And, and why was that? Well, the, the social system, essentially, you know, it, it wasn't cool to be an entrepreneur or a manufacturer, right? So the social system limited uh, any kind of entrepreneurship. It was seen as, uh, you know, less than, right? You know, why would you be, why would you be doing that? And at the end of the day too, the emperor, and he reigned forever, I'm sure they might have had to say, that he retained property rights And so what does that mean by he, him retaining property rights, right? That means that he could seize your stuff without notice, right? He could just be like, oh, that's really cool, that factory you made, or oh, that, that outdoor pool that you made is awesome. That's my new summer palace. So there wasn't a lot of reason, right? There, 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 essentially, you know, not only was it seen as less than, but it also, you kind of put a mark on yourself for the emperor to come around and be like, oh yeah, yeah, give me that. That's, that's, that's cool, I want that thing. Um, and, and, and so really the best way, so how, how did people, uh, you know, the social system, how did it operate, right? Well, essentially, you know, you, you waited every three years, there was like special bureaucrat test. So you pass to pass these, you know, standardized tests, right? And this was the way, you know, and, and so then you would, you would get, you know, some sort of lofty government appointment. And, you know, as we've seen in Greece and as we've seen in Beirut and everything like that, right? If you have a lofty government appointment and you add a little bit of corruption, you end up with some wealthy, people, right? So, so wealthy, you know, citizens. Essentially, that was the way for that, that. So at the end of the day, innovation and stuff is not rewarded. And, you know, the flow of money, right? You know, the rewards are going to corruption. And this is part of the reason why, you know, this Sung dynasty did not, uh, you know, continue in their, their great technological and economic development, right? So this is why the stagnation Right? It's all about incentives. All about incentives. So that leads us to, so we'll talk, so finishing up chapter seven, to talk about those, that last reason, right, the political and legal environment. What's up, Jake has the great get it so we don't see the uh, uh, mute your mic for me man I, I don't want to have to stop thanks bro uh, okay so well-defined property rights are an essential part of any any successful political uh, or legal regime right so what do, what do we mean by this well-defined 
property rights. So, you know, this is, you know, this is telling us who owns what. How can those things be used? And so, you know, this is determined Uh, you know, and, and really enforced by the court system. Right? You know, we have three branches of government, you know, executive, legislation, legislative, and uh, judiciary, right? So the judiciary system, they're the ones who, who define and enforce. We're, we're, well, they, they enforce it. I mean, they're actually... They're determined and enforced by the court. They're definitely enforced. Who are they also determined by? So this is more of the determined partly. Because also the other part of that like this, is uh, the legislative body. Also has a large role In the definition, the defining of property rights. And so, you know, a lot of people will think that this is kind of this, you know, outdated thing or whatever, right? But I mean, th this is a big risk that a lot of people uh, worry about when you're investing uh, in other countries, right? That, you know, other governments still what's called expropriate, right? They, they, they go ahead and they nationalize uh, different, you know, mines or railroad tracks or whatever the case may be, factories, right? Those kind of things. Um, and so, you know, when, when we talk about, uh, you know, the, the foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment literature, I told you guys a little bit about this. They, they, they talk about how there's this obsolescent bargain, right? where, you know, the, the investors are really, you know, they're making this choice whether or not to invest abroad. But then when they put all this money and they build these factories and they put these giant machines and everything there, right, they're kind of at the whim of that government to, you know, is that government going to protect them? Uh, you know, like, number one, do the laws say that the government's going to protect the foreign investor, right? So, I mean, take Take China, you know, you can't own land, uh, foreigners can't own land in China. If you want to have a business that's in China, it has to be so much uh, Chinese owned or whatever, right? And so, um, you know, and, and that they're not alone. There's a lot of places that have restrictions like that. Um, so, you know, number one, it may not even be possible, right, for you to do it. So, but some other places, they'll have it be possible, but then it's not enforced, right? Then, you know, or maybe it's enforced, but it takes, seven years to get through the courts or something. I mean, I, I remember at one point, the problem with India wasn't necessarily the fact that they had bad institutions in terms of like their laws and everything that was on the books. It was the fact that their court system was so backed up, nobody wanted to do business there because if you had a dispute, it was gonna take 10 years to get fixed. At that point, it's not worth it. Whatever you were trying to do, the resource isn't worth it anymore. You spent too much money on lawyers' fees. Uh, you know, nobody cares about it anymore. We've moved on to the next thing, right? So um, there's a lot of different reasons, right? So having a political and legal environment that supports that is, is not just essential to your own labor productivity and development. It's also essential to, you know, your, your, uh, your attractiveness for foreign capital. Because if you think about it, if you're one of these really poor African, South American countries, right, you know, you're not really going to be able to get to the rest of the world's living standards without foreign investment, right? Like it just it's like trying to do that just from your internal resources alone. Like unless you happen to, you know, strike a big natural gas deposit, like the Nordic countries or something, right? Like you know, um, unless you have some some natural resource boom, some windfall of money from that, 
uh, it's going to be very difficult without some foreign investment, right? So having an environment that's amenable that that kind of allows for those foreign investors to feel that they, you know there's not a high risk that it's going to be you know nationalized. Now, of course, there's going to be a risk. That's why they're there. They're there for the high return. Otherwise, they just be buying American stuff, right? They mean like American bonds, American stocks, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so the other thing, right? What Think of what happens if uh, you know there's not a lot of well-defined property rights, and if you know I just decided that I could break into the bean broker and it was just mine now, and I, you know me and some of my friends had a bunch of guns, and we were like, this is just ours, right? And you know, like that, that you know, like what, like so that would not, there wouldn't be stability, right? So you know, these property laws, these good political and legal environments help us to maintain uh, political and economic stability. And then lastly, you know, the presence of these institutions, right? You know, one of these things that we really take for granted, we're always talking about how, you know, our civil liberties are getting eroded, and it's true, and it's true. You know, nobody looked at what happened with the Patriot Act, you know, after 9-11 and, and what they said, and the NDAA every year has just been a, a, a rewatched version of that Patriot Act, right? So it's also, it's very true, but we're very, very, very much better off than most of the rest of the world, right? In terms of our freedoms, our ability to speak out against you know, the president against the, the governor and the other people, the, the, the mayor, the city council, right? And so this, you know, these political and legal environments, healthy ones allow for the promotion, free, promotion of free and open uh, exchange of ideas. Which, you know, at the end of the day, we think is good, right? Um, I mean, I guess at some point it could be bad if we're all just sitting around like talking philosophy while like nobody's paying attention to the fact that the crops are, you know, withering away and the cows are dying, right? You know, so like there's, there's probably a certain point where too much is bad, right? But, but the ability to, um, you know, is really a cornerstone of, uh, you know, just what it is to live in the West and, 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 and kind of, you know, it's a, we think it's one of the main determinants in terms of the labor productivity and kind of what makes capitalism tick, what makes it run so well. Um, now, you know, it, it's not as if increasing the economic GDP comes without any sort of costs, right? So some of the costs essentially, you know, if, if we're focusing on economic growth, right? Well, usually what does that mean? That means I'm going to increase my capital stock. Right? Well, what does it mean when I increase my capital stock? Well, everything else equal, that means that I have to decrease my consumption, right? So I've got less carpenters and less people that are, you know, remodeling homes and putting in extra bathrooms and things like that, right? And, you know, uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, the, the, there's, there's the she sheds and the man caves, right? So we've got less people doing that crap. We got more people, you know, making uh, factory floors and expanding, you know, production for, you know, like expanding steel production or something like that, right? Um, what else do we have? We've also got, uh, you know, there's going to be there's going to be more industrial robots that are made and fewer medical robots that are made, right? So that, that I like that example a lot, you know. So there's more industrial uh, kind of think of you know um, car producing robots right with the weird arms and stuff like that right and there'll be fewer life-saving medical assistance robots so you know at the end of the day, right, we're, we're, we're doing what that cost benefit analysis, right? And what's the cost benefit analysis? It's essentially between, you know, with consumption today uh, or consumption tomorrow, right? You know, there might be some health risks. You 
know, uh, when they were first making all these iPhones and stuff, right? There were reports coming out of the iPhone factories that, you know, they weren't giving the workers gloves or the gloves that they were giving them weren't very good. And so what was happening was that like the material that they used to like attach the screen to the thing, it's like not a good material that you want on your skin. And so it was getting into their skin and they were losing the, their ability to touch, like their ability to feel and their hands and their fingertips, right? You know, so like, there's, there's, some, there's some risks and you know, when you introduce new technologies, right? You know, the R&D costs a ton of money, right? R&D, research and development, is very costly. And, you know, there's a, usually a, quite a large positive externality, right? So positive externality, what do I mean by positive externality? I mean, you don't get to recoup all of the value added from that thing that you made, right? So, you know, uh, chipset producers, right? The person who uh, created, uh, you know, the first chipset for computers did not get to enjoy all of the, uh, you know, all the profit from that, right? So the first all of the benefits. And so what, what do we end up doing, right, as a result of this? Well, we usually end up having, uh, well, we don't end up having, I mean, the government ends up doing this for one reason or the other. Usually it's a military application, right? We have the government investing heavily in R&D, right? I mean, this is how we got, uh, this is how we got the internet, right? The internet started as the DARPA net. Which is the uh, defense arms program, like their internal network, uh, GPS, right? Uh, Global positioning system started was a you know military application first. And now you know everybody has it in their phones, right? And so you know at the end of the day, the government they're, not, they're going to invest not only in R and D, but they're also going to so they're going to invest in R and D to what to to promote growth. out of time sorry sorry guys on friday <laughs> I, kept the people. I thought the class on friday was a class on thursday which is 2 to 3 3 15 and so at like 308 on friday i was like oh i'm so sorry you guys are very patient <laughs> so i'm keeping an eye i hear you the first uh okay so the government what are they also going to do right the government is also going to promote growth with human capital right so the promotion of growth through human capital investment, right? So what does this look like, right? Well, you know, we've got US public education programs, right? You know, you guys have been through them. K through 12. We've also got a, uh, a surge of what's called Head Start programs. Uh, which, you know, this is for preschool children. And then, you know, the government also has, and like I told you guys before, this is like the worst use of money, but we still have it. We've got job training and retraining programs for existing adults. Not many though, honestly. Like most of the, most of the job training and retraining programs that I'm aware of, are all like programming oriented, like data boot camp, right? Like come live in New York or San Francisco or whatever, LA for 
six months and you know we're going to train you up and you know our placement rate is 95 percent afterwards right so you come in you have no idea how to do any programming it puts you through the ringer it's like an immersive it's like when you go to a different country and you learn the language there it's like a similar kind of program um so honestly i don't you know this this is i would say these have decreased very much over time but why does the government do this right why does the government do this the government does this because Uh, there's a few reasons, right? So, so there's a few different externalities. So, you know, the first one is, you know, we're about to experience this, right? Like, I hope you guys are registered to vote. I hope you guys, you know, are, are checking that you're registered to vote, right? Make sure that your address is updated. Uh, last I heard, we're all getting automatic mail-in ballots sent to us. So as soon as you get that, you know, don't even pop it in the mail. Just go drop it in the in the box. It's right outside the courthouse, right? Um, I mean, you know, you can't put it in the mail, but I mean, we're in such a small town. How many times do you go past that freaking courthouse, right? So just just put it in your car, walk down there, drop it down there, right? A democracy works better with educated work with educated workers, right? Educated voters, voters, that. So you know it's really it's really tough to make a to make a decision when you're not aware of all the issues and how they're interacting with each other and and the different sides of the issues and the different uh, uh, you know justifications the different evidence for each issue right um, the, the other thing is you know we we do have a progressive tax scheme right so progressive tax taxes that they're going to capture some of that higher income. So it's kind of an investment that the government's going to get back later in terms of they're going to get more taxes off you, right? There's going to be an increased chance in technical innovation. And then lastly, you know, one of the reasons why the government uh, would pay for it is essentially, you know, as a, as a favor, right, to be nice. Because the families that, you know, need it most or may want it most, may also be the poorest. Because they can't afford it, right? So, you know, poor families can't pay. And so at the end of the day, you know, this is, this is, a, a, this is kind of the redistributive aspect of All right, and we will pick up with uh, chapter eight in class on Wednesday. So go ahead, finish chapter seven on your own. Uh, make sure you learn a little bit about the limits to growth and why uh, the book says that there aren't really any limits to growth. And we'll, we'll talk about that on Wednesday.